This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Equity Research. In today's episode, I'm joined by energy blogger and author Doomberg for a conversation about the necessity of energy in our lives, how we take it for granted, and the implications for our economies and our politics. Doomberg is a pen name and alias, assuming the form of a green chicken online. Originally on Twitter and now on Substack, Doomberg has become the most popular financial newsletter on the platform. Doomberg explains why he has chosen to operate anonymously, helping him explore and explain complex and technical aspects of the energy debate with unusual clarity often overlooked or ignored by mainstream media and policy makers. In this fascinating discussion, Doomberg explains why energy is fundamental to human life, why our dizzying technical expertise in extracting hydrocarbons is overlooked and even denigrated by people whose very lives depend on it, what the connection is between energy and human flourishing, how our thinking has been held hostage by Malthusian beliefs of pessimism leading to energy crises, economic decline and political unrest. We also talk about the recent COP28 gathering and the renewed pursuit of nuclear energy. I've learned much from Doomberg about energy, economics and how our world works. In so doing, he demonstrates the changing nature of our media and how the internet can be used as a force for informed debate on important but complex topics. I find his approach refreshing and inspiring. Please enjoy my conversation with the maverick, Doomberg. Doomberg, welcome to the podcast. Jeremy, my pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of your work. I read your stuff when it comes out. I've learned a lot from it. And I'm not just a big fan of what you say, but I'm also a big fan of how you say it. Can you tell us about your background? What motivated you to start Doomberg? Why the anonymity and why a chicken? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to take the hoses in order. Um, I'm a scientist by training. I'd spent roughly 20 years in industry uh, working on various commodity technologies, leading technology teams around the world. Retired from industry, started a consulting firm a couple of years before COVID hit. I was doing quite well uh, until COVID hit. And as you can imagine, like many small business owners, we had a lot of challenges as we navigated our way through the COVID crisis. And we lost some 85% of our business, and we were forced to reinvent ourselves. And on the advice of a pretty famous hedge fund manager, we got into the business of helping people who create content for a living run their businesses better, especially the subset of those who were selling into Wall Street. And in so doing, we learned that this was something that we could do. And at the urging of our best client, we realized there was an inefficiency in the market, which is the energy discussion was missing the industrial voice. So if, if you participate in the global warming debates or you know, energy debates of the day, almost all of the participants are university professors or government officials. And because if you're employed in industry, you're shielded from public discourse by risk averse public affairs teams, that industry voice was missing. And so the anonymity was born out of a need to grow quickly in a crowded social media landscape. We grew our business on Twitter originally, now known as X, allegedly. And on Twitter, you know, my face wouldn't stand out nearly as well as a green chicken would, we thought. And um, the concept was people of our ilk are constantly scrolling for doom. And, and the original concept was Chicken Little gets a terminal, and hence the, the funny name Doomberg. And um, we had this vision of Chicken Little scrolling away on the, on the terminal, looking for headlines to worry about. That was the brand concept. And so the green chicken was just a natural embodiment. Once we, it's, a, it's a $5 piece of clip art that we just recolored. You could see the green chicken outline in other advertisements and stuff. And once we started to grow, it took off. I mean, obviously well beyond our wildest dreams. We built up our Twitter following to over a quarter million people before ultimately we we decided to leave Twitter. And we built our newsletter to over 200,000 email subscribers, which is stunning and humbling and and amazing. We're the number one paid finance substack in the world a year and a half after launching. That's fantastic. Congratulations. But once you grow a brand like we do, and there's another reason, of course, is we're a small team and I am not Doomberg. I'm the voice of Doomberg on podcast and I'm the head writer, but we have a very powerful team behind us, including a world-class editor, which I think is a key driver of our success. I, I think every writer needs an editor and an editor is not a proofwriter. An editor is somebody who takes a good piece of writing and makes it great. And so once we caught the tiger by the tail, 
we have observed that when an anonymous brands de-anonymize, the brand entry can collapse. And we're very protective of the brand. It's the work of my life. It has been transformative for us. It's what we do full time. And the thought of doing something to damage that brand is, well, it's, it's unthinkable. And so um, many, many hundreds of people know who we are. It's not some great secret, but we just keep the anonymity for the brand intrigue uh, more than anything else at this point. It will certainly work for me. I can't remember whether I first saw you on Twitter or heard you on a podcast and then couldn't get rid of you on Twitter in the nicest possible way. But it worked for me. And I think I first came across you probably two years ago, the early part of the post-invasion period of peaking, of spiking oil prices, energy prices, and been following what you do ever since. I appreciate that. I should say the customer journey, as you described it, is difficult for people to articulate, but it involves usually something along the lines of an impression becomes an engagement, becomes an email subscriber, becomes paid. And Yeah, I can remember hearing you talk, I think it was on the Forward Guidance podcast in uh, sort of early, sort of maybe spring 2022, talking about the predicament of Europe and and sort of natural gas pricing in Europe and North America. And it was one of those penny drop moments. And, um, you know, that's kind of, I'd imagine that whole period when you were building your business was helpful in your journey. Yeah, uh, of course. We sincerely don't hope for crises, but energy crises in particular do represent tailwinds for those who have the ability to articulate scientific concepts that affect the markets and affect people's lives in a way that the lay people can understand. And that's one of the things that we try to specialize in, which is to yeah. distill, distill complexity for our readers into something um, they can access. As a non-scientist, that is very helpful and apparent. And your tagline to your blog is energy is life, which is hard to argue against on any kind of level. But can you just explain <laughs> why that is so significant? Can you just explain that tagline to us? It's interesting that you say it is hard to argue against because we have found the need to argue for it to be quite surprising. And this is actually an important point to the vast majority of the privileged members of the Western world. Energy comes from a light switch. You know, food comes from a few taps on your phone. You don't even have to go to the grocery store. <laughs> yep, yep. And as the distance between the consumer of primary energy and the producers of primary energy continues to grow, we are losing a visceral connection to the critical importance of primary energy. Your standard of living is quite literally the sum of the primary energy you get to harness. Bright angles do not appear spontaneously in nature. The human endeavor is a constant, unrelenting struggle against entropy. And in order to impose order on your local environment, you have to waste heat. Fundamentally, everybody's standard of living ultimately traces back to some machine somewhere wasting heat. And the total amount of standard of living you get to spread across your society is driven by how much primary energy you get to access. Either you drill for it yourself or buy it on the open market. But the more energy you have at the front end of your economy, the better standard of living that you can provide for your citizens. If you plot GDP per capita against energy use per capita, there are no rich countries without energy. Absolutely. Yep. It just doesn't yeah. exist. And so this is a fundamental fact that we need to get reintroduced to. I, I would argue that British citizens and members of the EU urgently need to get re-familiarized with this critically important concept because I think the energy policy of Europe has been nothing short of a disaster and the political stability issues we're seeing beginning to percolate in countries like Germany come as no surprise to us. Yeah. And it's really interesting. You talk about the ability, which you clearly have, to bring to life the sophistication and complexity and sheer technological brilliance of the energy industry that is uh, glossed over by our by the policymakers and our political masters for, well, one can only speculate the reason why, but it definitely seems to be the case. And therefore, we have this commonly held simplified view of what energy is. I, it's just the other end, the other side of a light switch. But what do, you, what do you think are the biggest commonly understood or misunderstood energy fallacies out there? I would say the only industry that has done a worse job of bragging about what it does uh, than the the fossil fuel companies is perhaps the nuclear power industry. We have this belief tied to the magic of our phone devices that the embodiment of technology is in the form of companies like Apple and Google and Facebook. And, And when you think about it, they basically outsource manufacturing and they're in the business of selling advertisements. It's not much more complicated than that. They traffic in your information for profit. As anybody who has spent any time in the commodity sector can attest, 
there are scores of thousands of brilliant PhDs and technicians and engineers and field workers who do the dizzying array of work that makes modern life possible. And not only do we take them for granted, we denigrate them. And it's, you know, heaven forbid, they ever decide to go on strike. You know, <laughs> it wouldn't take but a few days for society to fall to its knees and beg them to come back. I'll just give you one example. We're writing about Saudi Arabia next and their $100 billion plus investment in the world's largest shale gas field, not currently situated in the US. And anyone who's ever interacted with Saudi Aramco can attest, like this is one of the most technologically superior, brilliant companies on earth. We think of them as, you know, petrostate national oil companies, but the size and scale and bewildering array of industrial processes, machines, pipes, reactors, all controlled by top-end computers, the underground ability to map resources and to micro-target their exploitment that relies on you know, some of the world's fastest supercomputers. These are the most important technology companies on earth. We, you, I, everybody listening, would quickly find ourselves unable to provide for our families should they go away. And I think it's high time that we begin to treat them with a little bit more respect. I guess if you ask most people what the US's biggest technological achievement is or has been of the last 20 years, they'd say Amazon, Google, Apple, or, or just the internet and its amazing transformation of how we live our lives. But would you put shale fracking up there alongside that? I would put it at the top of the list, of course. I mean, the US since 2010 integrated over oil and natural gas and the light liquids in between has added roughly two and a half Saudi Arabians to the global energy mix. The U.S. produces 20 million barrels a day of oil and petroleum products. And one of the things we've argued in a recent piece is that the definition of oil itself is undergoing a semantic shift, and we think oil should be considered any hydrocarbon that finds its way into a refinery. The U.S. produces so much natural gas that at some points, in some regions, it, it's it's negatively priced. The people are paying to get rid of it because it is a byproduct of the production of light, sweet crude oil in the Permian, for example. Now, this may or may not last. There's some high profile energy analysts that think some of the major US shale gas fields are ripe for turning over. And that may be. And if they do quickly, that would certainly cause another energy crisis. But the US, just to give you some numbers, produces over 100 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. And in 2022, the world produced just under 400 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. So more than 25% of total natural gas production is currently happening in the U.S. The world is building out liquefied natural gas import and export facilities at a staggering rate. When the energy crisis of Europe is finally and truly over and the full consequences of the aftermath are materialized, the world will be left with a far more efficient natural gas network. Natural gas is difficult to transport. It's a gas. Um, there is a reason why oil is preferred and coal is the easiest of them all to transport because it's a solid. But once the big investments are made and you have 10, 15, 20% intra-market penetration vis-a-vis -vis the LNG infrastructure that is being brought online right now, you're going to see the ability to produce natural gas will be made easier. The deflationary impact of technology and investment in this case will allow for a global natural gas market to materialize. Natural gas will trade around the world for roughly the same price. The difference in various areas being the um, you know, MPV break-even cost of uh, running an LNG carrier. So maybe five, six dollars per million BTU as the wedge. And when that happens, the world will you know, continue to use more and more fossil fuels. Is this time last year we were on, we were all expecting and fearing a major shortage of natural gas. Now we ended up paying, I mean, we, the whole of Europe ended up paying a global price for natural gas that priced everyone else out of the market or a lot of other people out of the market. Were you surprised by the speed with which Europe has seemingly been able to secure its natural gas supply for the foreseeable future? I would say that one of the main drivers last year was the unusually warm winter. And I would say so far this year, the weather gods have been smiling again on Europe thankfully. And as is often the case, one of the things we've been studying, we were quick to point out the crisis. And I think we stayed with the crisis call longer than market was telling us was wise. And, you know, one of our objectives as analysts is to focus a lot more of our time and attention on what we got wrong, as opposed to what we got right, because that is the way to learn. And the thing that we learned from 
the European energy crisis is just how fungible the primary energy sources are and just how little of an imbalance either way can drive enormous price increases and price decreases. And so we wrote a piece where we asked the question at the beginning, what do precipitation levels in Sichuan province in China have to do with the price of coal in Appalachia? Yeah. And, and once you understand that answer, the answer is the more it rains in Sichuan, the less coal China needs. Coal is a globally traded commodity. Huge rains in Sichuan represent a uh, headwind for all global primary energy prices, including oil, because these things have enough interchangeability and substitutability that a glut anywhere in the world can get translated into the markets just as fast as a shortage anywhere in the world, like we saw in Europe in 2021, also gets translated into the markets. It works both ways. Price elasticity demand is a two-sided coin. And so judging the flows is our main job now. And so this is why we came up with a relatively bearish piece on natural gas called liquefied natural glut. Um, we, we studied that market for, we have a pro tier where we do a, a monthly doom zoom, we call it a, a 40 slide presentation to our top subscribers. And November's was all about the global natural gas market. And after completing that global survey and recognizing that the implementation of a sufficient number of LNG export and import terminals would soon make that market far more efficient, it was impossible to deny that we are in a period of glut. And that glut is one of the reasons, for example, that oil is in the 70s, despite the crisis in the Middle East. The primary fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, tend to trade with a high degree of correlation. And when you saw $100 per million BTU natural gas in Europe, which I would say is roughly $600 a barrel oil, that drove investment. It always does. And we've seen contracts signed, billions being invested, uh, authorities accelerating the approval of projects. Canada's new LNG is coming on. Russia's new LNG is coming on. The U.S. has continued to build out LNG, although there is some political pressure to perhaps slow that build out, which we can talk about. Well, even um, Germany managed to build an LNG res receiving plant in less than a year, I think, didn't they? Uh, well, they were able to create the infrastructure needed to receive yes. LNG from a floating rate, uh, a floating uh, LNG terminal, which is, which is different than building out a, a full one. But still, nonetheless, it goes to show in a crisis, governments will do everything. And you made a very important point, which is one of the w ways in which Europe escaped true catastrophe, and again, we are the first to be glad that they did, was by scouring the world for every BTU of energy that they could get their hands on, regardless of cost, and most importantly, regardless of carbon footprint, which is why we saw this massive retreat to the coal mines in Germany that we like to say was with the speed and efficiency of the evacuation of Dunkirk. They brought back on a, an unthinkable amount of coal they continue to shut down the nuclear power plants. And now they have one of the dirtiest grids in, in Europe, despite wasting roughly a trillion dollars on, on solar and wind. It's truly a sad and remarkable story. What you just described there is human adaptability and ingenuity. There is this sustainable allure of the philosophy of pessimism, probably first articulated by Thomas Malthus a couple of hundred years ago, which has been proven to be so unhelpful and so wrong, in my personal opinion. What is it that sustains it despite all the evidence and the evidence of the last couple of years, the last couple of decades, the last couple of centuries? Um, what is it that sustains it in this, um, against all the evidence that it is, um, that is wrong? I believe one of the foundational axioms of Malthusian thinking is a consistent underestimation of the exponential rate of technological progress that humanity is able to continuously achieve. The prospect of fracking and horizontal drilling would have sounded indistinguishable from magic just years before it suddenly became yes. widely deployed and really commoditized. There are many who argue that we are burning through what they call the carbon pulse of a relatively finite and dwindling uh, supply of, of fossil fuels. But measured against that, and a force that is in opposition to that, is this dizzying array of technological development that is also going through its own singularity of sorts. And if you just look at Ray Kurzweil's book from the mid-2000s, The Singularity is Near, and you open up the first chapter and you, you look at the projected increases in computing power that humanity will be able to achieve, we're right on that number, some 15, 20 years later. And, and there's no end in sight. And so our view is the Earth is not a closed system, of course. It is bombarded with an enormous amount of energy every day from the sun. 
We have a limitless supply of uranium, effectively. We can power ourselves and grow the economy for many, many decades, betting on the exponential nature of technology. See, humans tend to be pessimistic for totally rational Darwinian reasons. But also, it is difficult for us to project an exponential. We are linear thinkers, backwards looking and forwards looking. If you got in a time machine and went back just 20 years ago, society would be indistinguishable to you. The power that we have in our pockets today, it's just unthinkable. And you know th this deflationary force of technological progress is going to continue. AI is going to spread even further. Children of the emerging world have unlimited free access to MIT curriculums. How, how, ma how many geniuses have we missed that we will now find? The real and true ugly history of the Malthusian movement, of course, is that it was born out of eugenics. Yes. And there's a really dark past that the Sierra Club and Greenpeace would like nobody to notice. They would prefer to have it all memory hold. But, but if you go back and you read what was written in the New York Times back in the 1970s, and frankly, deeply racist things that were considered acceptable to say, which let's just say do not age well. And by the way, there's 5 billion people in the global south. Who are we to deny them the basic human right to try and develop and to provide a better standard of living for their families? Uh, it's Absolutely. Just shameful yeah. that, to think this way in 2024, in our view. So what was your assessment of the recent gathering in Dubai for COP28? Um, COP28 was interesting. Uh, another one of our Doom Zoom presentations for our pro tier, we covered our readout from that event. Uh, we called it coulda, woulda, shoulda, because we were making fun of the uh, arguments over semantics that this farce had dissolved into. Should became could and, and so on. It was, it's all, it's really, you can't make it up. I mean, it truly is the luxury of the rich to argue over semantics uh, at a meeting like this. Having said that, we do think it was an important meeting for two reasons. And the first reason that we think it is important is because ultimately, we suspect that this will mark peak ESG, that this is the moment where you know, ESG and the mania around it reached its apex. Secondly, and most importantly, perhaps, uh, we think the world agreed on a grand bargain uh, coming out of COP28. And um, that grand bargain had six points to it. And let me just read them quickly, and we could cover any of those six that you would like. The first is coal will be phased out in the West, and it will ultimately be replaced by a combination of natural gas and nuclear power. But the developing world <coughs> will continue to burn coal to improve its standard of living. Third, where possible, carbon capture and sequestration will be used to minimize direct CO2 emissions. Most importantly, perhaps, industry will do its best to minimize methane emissions. I think the deal that was cut on methane is probably the most important thing to ever come out of a cop. It will have a real and meaningful impact on our emissions in a time period measured in years. Nuclear power, again, will be accelerated to further decarbonize electricity grids. I think it is very important that for the first time in the, um, the global readout of the meeting, nuclear was definitively characterized as a clean technology, which is an affront to the, the last dying wishes of the Malthusians as they age their way to exit stage left. And then the last one is the West will continue to tinker around with solar and wind and electric vehicles and pretend as though this will be a meaningful contributor to our energy future. Because, you know, once a grift like this gets started, it's really hard to put the brakes on it. Uh, in our view, those are the six big takeaways from the meeting. And I, and I do think overarching all of that is, is what really has to be considered peak ESG at this point. So you think the methane abatement agreement was more significant than the commitment from, I think it was 22 nations to triple nuclear energy production. The methane agreement is more important than the, the commitment to triple nuclear power for, for a variety of reasons. First of which, it's going to get done. The industry will deliver against that objective. Second, methane, if you believe you know certain global warming potential calculations, uh, methane is a meaningful driver of CO2 equivalent emissions, some order of magnitude more damaging than carbon dioxide is, for example. Yes. And since it has such a short lifetime, once we get methane emissions under control, we should very quickly see the desired impact. And then third, which is kind of a nuanced view, but 
our opinion is the development of primary energy is always additive. So the U.S. stops burning coal, just makes coal more available for China, and they burn it. And so nuclear energy tripling in its capacity will be greedily and readily absorbed by the global energy infrastructure, but it's not going to displace some other form of energy. It's just going to make that other form of energy cheaper and more available to the developing world. And so as narrowly measured by impact on the climate, I think it's just undeniable that the methane emission agreement is far more impactful than the proposed tripling of, of nuclear power, which we wholeheartedly support, by the way. In recent months, we've seen hydrocarbon energy prices weaken. And as you mentioned, which is interesting, particularly the backdrop of rising military tensions in the Middle East, for example. But post-COP, or pre and post-COP, but it seems to get an acceleration post-COP, the uranium price has sort of gone exponential. Uranium isn't that difficult to find. At $104 a pound, one would imagine everyone connected with anything to do with the uranium extraction industry is going full tilt to increase production here. Is it the case, as with oil and gas, where we've seen the solution for high prices is high prices? Great question with a lot of dimensions. So first of all, $100 a pound uranium is incredibly cheap. Second of all, the price of uranium could quadruple from here and nobody would notice it in their electricity bills because the fuel input costs of a nuclear reactor are relatively modest compared to the total system costs. Measuring the sensitivity of an electricity grid's cost that is being run by coal and you're measuring that sensitivity to the price of coal, it is a direct translation. Yes. Because fuel is really the input cost that matters. Yeah. Whereas with nuclear, yeah, it's... It's important. It's a bit of a nuisance. Availability matters more than price. There will, be a, there will be a response. But I should say that if you look at the industrial break-even cost analysis, because uranium producers are nothing but price takers, yes. the, the marginal production cost for the, the highest in, you know, price mine is, was somewhere around $80 a pound. And, and it's only very recently that we have climbed over that number. And I think in the industry, there is some hesitation. Now, there's two things to watch. One, of course, is this ongoing vacuuming up supply of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which I must say, I'm surprised it's legal. <laughs> it, it certainly seems to be an indirect attempt to corner the market. But it, by, by all, I guess it is. And, and I have a lot of respect for the Sprott team. And we own Sprott Physical Gold Trust, for example, when we want to express our views on gold in the paper markets. So just surprising to me that regulators tolerate what amounts to a cornering of incremental supply uh, by these uh, ETFs. Having said that, there's also the situation in Kazakhstan and some uncertainty around what is currently the largest producer of uranium will be doing and is capable of doing. And then finally, layered on top of all of this is it's not just the price of uranium that matters, but we need enriched uranium for the the latest reactor designs. And, and Russia currently has an effective commercial monopoly on this. And um, it's long past time that the West sets about the task of doing something about it. It's, it's fully loaded cost is, is driven artificially higher by, you know, um, seven nines worth of safety regulations and our, our crazy fear of nuclear radiation. Um, but nonetheless, yes, the, the point stands. You can double, triple, quadruple the price of uranium from here and um, the world would not be thrown into a crisis in the same way that it was when natural gas went up tenfold uh, in Europe, because you saw the immediate translation of those costs into both other primary fossil fuels and also electricity bills uh, rather quickly. And so tens of billions were ultimately spent, either directly or indirectly, to support businesses and to minimize the impact of, of that price increase. You're hearing no such talk as uranium uh, goes uh, exponential here, I would say. I have many friends who are in the uranium market and they've been trading for a very long time and waiting for this day in the sun. And I'm very happy for them. We have no position currently, but this, this has a bit of a Icarus print feel to it. I would be cautious. You know, markets don't go straight up forever. Um, sometimes they go down and traditionally one needs to express a bit of caution at the moment of maximum euphoria. We, we shall see if, if this time is any different. What do you think is the future of OPEC? Like anything, this goes in cycles. Uh, sometimes these cycles are measured in decades. To return to a conversation we had earlier, one of the driving forces of U.S. foreign policy from the time of Kissinger to the time of shale was this belief that the U.S. had long ago passed its peak oil production and would need to find oil on the international market. 
and we believe this drove much of the military uh, adventurism that, uh, in hindsight, uh, was rather tragic. And the advent of shale has allowed the U.S. to become, once again, the global energy superpower. It is making more oil and petroleum projects than uh, products than any country has ever produced, and it is more than energy independent. And in fact, it is producing uh, so much energy that it's it's exporting a lot of it. The, the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis OPEC could be even stronger. We wrote a piece about how if we could somehow resuscitate the Monroe Doctrine, but with a healthy dose of respect for our neighbors, that the Western Hemisphere could really dominate energy markets for decades if we just got our act together. There's an enormous amount of both conventional and unconventional fossil fuels to be developed in the Western Hemisphere. The constraints to that, that development are largely political, geopolitical. Um, these are not geological constraints. They are they're human imposed constraints. And with an effective diplomatic core and a, a foreign policy built on a foundation of respect and co-creation of value and sharing it fairly, the Western Hemisphere could be largely independent of OPEC. Given what you're saying about LNG, the liquefied natural glut and the abundance of energy, particularly in the US, but that we're enjoying currently, are we about to enjoy a period such as the you know, another roaring 20s from an economic perspective? It's a little more nuanced than that. I think the U.S. is going to come out just fine. Look, countries that are awash in hydrocarbons and are running large fiscal deficits and have an accommodative central bank tend not to slip into a recession. We wrote a piece on this a few weeks ago uh, explaining the missing U.S. recession, which I think many, including us, thought would necessarily follow when the Fed raised interest rates from zero to 5% uh, in record speed. It hasn't materialized. I think we have to acknowledge that again. When you, when you are in error, uh, this is a, an extremely valuable learning opportunity and one we embrace. But you know, if you go to Europe, uh, I, I don't see a path out in the short term from the deindustrialization and economic malaise that is falling over the continent. I think we are beginning to see uh, a totally predictable, because we predict it, far right uh, emergence, uh, you know, populistic backlash to out of touch European elites. Um, and their response to this rising uh, of far-right politicians is is almost certainly going to be as bumbled as its energy policy was. I think um, they're playing very dangerous games in Europe today, and I, we would be bearish political stability in the EU, whereas, of course, the U.S. has its own issues as well. But from an energy perspective, look, we are, always say the first thing you must ask yourself as an, as an analyst of economies is, is this particular economy currently experiencing a period of energy abundance or shortage? And once you have that answer, either way, the rest becomes a little easier to explain. So is Joe Biden a good oil trader or was he just lucky? I think Joe Biden is playing an effective game that his opponents on the right refuse to acknowledge, which is he plays footsie with the far environment to the left, but deep down hides behind the fact that in the U.S., commodity development has a lot of say at the state level as opposed to the federal level, and he's not really pushing to interfere with states like Texas and Louisiana and, and so on. California, of course, has decided to um, remove itself from the energy game and is therefore a vassal uh, within the U.S. Same with New England. But for the heart of the U.S., there is really two, two Americas, of course, and, uh, both politically and geologically and and economically, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, uh, Appalachia are producing an enormous amount of energy, and this benefits the world. 2024 is a year of national elections. It's the first time, or likely to be the first time since 1964, that we've got a UK general election here, coinciding with a US presidential election. On your home turf, you, the the outcome of the U.S. election and its impact on markets. Are we going to get Biden or Trump? It's a very dangerous time in the U.S. politically for reasons that have nothing to do with energy. Taking a step back, of course, I should say up front, we consider ourselves ideologues, not partisans, and we bemoan the descent into partisan food fighting that much of Western politics um, has endured in the past several decades. Um, what used to be considered unthinkable is now common and very, very dangerous trend. So just objectively, zooming out, the unquestioned 
Republican nominee, like Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee, yeah. is being actively indicted by his political opponents and proactively being removed from ballots by unelected officials. Like, this is not the stuff of sound institutional democracies. I thought in um, that context, it was very interesting what Jamie Dimon said at Davos last week. I don't know if you saw that. Clip. I did. And yeah. he is 100% correct. Whatever you think of the man. Sure. Um, and believe me, um, he didn't get my vote. But objectively, he is a he is the Republican nominee. He's going to be the he's a former president of the United States. Yeah. And Democratic attorney generals are indicting him all over the country. I think he's up to 60 felony charges. Now, you may think all of those charges are deserved. You could probably even make a case in that regard. It doesn't change the fact that this is a truly dangerous situation for half the country. Don't forget, he got the second most votes of any presidential candidate ever when Biden defeated him. And there's a lot of controversy in the U.S. about that election, which... And there yeah, seems to be a direct is. correlation with the number of indictments and the elevation of those indictments in the public consciousness seems to correlate directly with his support. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a Streisand effect situation for sure. But again, as a assessment of the health of the U.S. democracy, nobody can look at the current situation and say everything is peachy. Okay, but look, 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 look past the volatility of whatever comes in November. Let's say he wins. What then? What? What? what I you... think. I think neither side is prepared to accept the victory of their opponent, which is what makes this very dangerous. If if Trump wins, there will be all manner of people on the left who will think he is an illegitimate president and they will genuinely fear and believe that we have descended into dictatorship. And if the left wins, Trump supporters will assume the election was stolen again. And, and this is the reality on the ground. And in fact, this is all made much worse by the curation of social media and, and the curation of news that people are reading. You talk to Trump voters and they don't know anybody who voted for Biden and vice versa. That is not good. So I happen to think that the media is radically underestimating Trump's popularity in flyover country, which has happened to be where I live. And so I have a firsthand sort of visceral experience of why the man is popular. He's effectively a protest vote against Washington, D.C. and the corrupt uni party system. This is not a partisan issue. The, the, the Typical Trump voter believes Republicans and Democrats alike are to be wiped away from Washington, and he is the only one who is willing to say and do the things necessary to get that accomplished. Now, again, you might think everything I'm saying is insane and that Donald Trump is a repugnant person and that a man of his character and background should, shouldn't be anywhere near the presidency, and all those things might be true, but it doesn't, it doesn't excuse you from having to deal with the fact that he is going to win the Republican nomination and very likely to have a much higher energy campaign than Biden. And his supporters believe that the election was stolen from him and will not accept another defeat at the polls uh, if one should materialize. And that is not a healthy situation no. for either side. Just for the sake of the conversation. And whoever becomes the president decides that they want to appoint a chicken as its energy secretary. What would you do? What would you what would you be your program for US energy policy in the new administration? Yes, it's a great question. In fact, one that we've given some thought to. Uh, we wrote uh, we, we, we did a presentation to our approacher called King Doomberg, um, where we we addressed this exact <laughs> this exact issue. And um, it's really comes down to uh, one word, which is trade off. And you know, having published hundreds of articles, mostly on energy, we have come to the conclusion that the one thing missing from the public discourse is a proper focus on the trade-offs of the various primary energy uh, resources that are available to us. And once you ponder trade-offs, you very quickly come down to what we call uh, in, in this presentation, the, sort of the grand equation, the ultimate trade-off equation. And this is the number that I would be measuring and publicizing and encouraging our citizens to be aware of. And it is the following. It is the ratio of our net primary energy produced divided by pollution and CO2 emissions. So I think we spend way too much time focusing on CO2 emissions and not enough time focusing on pollution. 
Um, but also we were, we never ponder the the numerator, which is the net energy produced, which as we mentioned is is a measure of your standard of living. Now, once you have that equation, all things being equal, less CO2 emissions is, is good. All things being equal, less pollution is good. All things being equal, more energy is better. And then from that framework, we would be obviously pro-nuclear. Uh, we would uh, support the deployment of carbon capture and sequestration. We would get rid of the wind industry. Uh, we think it is a parasite on electricity grids. Solar can work in some places, and we would support it uh, in those locations uh, to a degree. Um, we would reorient our focus away from full battery electric vehicles and towards plug-in hybrids because on a pound of battery material basis, plug-in hybrids abate way more fossil fuels than do full BEVs. Um, we would build pipelines to connect the prolific natural gas and oil fields uh, of central U.S. to New England and California. Uh, we would work to remove the U.S. Northeast from home heating oil. It's, it's insane that we burn oil to create heat in homes today in, in some of the more populous parts of the country. And so there's a variety of things that we would do. Um, that's just a small list. Uh, we would get rid of the Jones Act. There's all kinds of sort of nuanced details that make the U.S. energy situation less efficient than it could be. But the one word that everyone coming away from this um, should remember is trade-offs. And we would measure those trade-offs. We would talk about them. And we would have an open political discourse on them. What is your engagement with what one might describe as mainstream media, mainstream policymakers in the in your field, and government? Uh, you know, I'm aware that you are on Substack. You used to be on Twitter, now X, but have decided not to be in going forward. But I don't read articles about you in the Financial Times. I haven't seen a guest editorial by you in the Wall Street Journal. And is that something that you would aspire to, to, to develop into, or do you see that as just the, the old way of doing things? I mean, it's, it's, frankly, it is the old way of doing things. The mainstream media is dying. It's dying in credibility, and it's dying in revenue. And Substack um, is just one of, an important one, of a variety of means by which we are developing what we call the gig economy for brains. And to the extent that we have been able to, to be a category leader in an emerging media technology like Substack, we have, I think, substantial influence on thought leaders, but it never finds its way into the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, as you say. But our connection to our subscribers is very intimate. And we have all manner of public company CEOs and senior vice presidents and government officials and staffers and wealthy investors on our Rolodex of paid subscribers. And, you know, our comment section, for example, is close to paid subscribers. And every time we publish an article, we get hundreds of, of really thoughtful, polite, insightful comments and back and forth and extra links. And have you thought about this? And they challenge our work. They make us better. And it's like a polite version of Twitter, but limited to really smart people who um, who are actively engaged and care about the topic. It's really amazing. This is how the internet could be. It doesn't need to be this engagement harvesting, algorithm-driven enrage machine um, that you know Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, have become. Um, and in fact, people are rejecting that. that the, the unstated mission of Substack, or perhaps it's stated, is to change the way people read on the internet. And I, I think they're really onto something. Um, and so to the extent that we've been able to um, develop our own brand. It's been very lucrative. And we have generously helped everybody who ever wanted to come on Substack because we are big believers in the platform. I should say we are a, a relatively small equity owners in the company. We participated in their recent author-led round. And I think it's important to disclose when you have even small conflicts of interest like this, but we would have the same opinion. In fact, the reason we invested is because we have this opinion. You, we've talked briefly around the situation in Germany, which is bad, but one wonders why it isn't worse, given the decisions that have been made, and you've basically got an economy based, seemingly based on the premise of cheap Russian energy and selling value-added products into China. You couldn't really imagine a worse set of circumstances. Is it just gently going to get worse? Why isn't it worse than it already is? Because sure, things are tough. But it's not exactly, in terms of the aggregate output, economic output data, it's not 
so obvious that everybody's writing about the fact that Germany is in technical recession. It's pretty bad. It must be said. And the impacts of this situation will be felt for many, many years as the investments that weren't made fail to materialize <laughs> yeah. in the form of, of you know, advanced manufacturing. And it must be said that the German energy policy in particular is so crazy and so illogical that one has to wonder what are the true foundations of its genesis. And this is something that will be written about in the history books for decades. It, it is such a head scratcher. It is so obviously stupid that one has to believe it's done on purpose and, and who is driving these decisions and what are their motivations is, is an open question to me. Just take, for example, the decision to close three and then ultimately six of their last nuclear power plants in the middle of an energy crisis. Yeah. It, it makes, and look, look what's going on in Spain today. S similar nonsense, just utter insanity. I, it's a great, I, I wish I had a better answer. Uh, I think the pain is real. It is going to be pronounced. The, the political upheaval that is coming will only add to the economic challenges. Nobody likes to invest in politically unstable regions, and Germany's about to become one. And it's a real tragedy because the German economic model was working. It was a brilliant one. Um, you know, upgrade and resell cheap energy from Russia, develop downstream manufacturing to take full advantage of it, and uh, develop export markets in China um, to, to move your product. It was brilliant. It worked brilliantly. So what role do you think Russia played in this, in Germany's decision to close its nuclear reactors? I think the role of Russian propaganda in the support of renewables and the destruction of the nuclear sector in Germany needs to be fully explored. Um, but I would say they've, even the Russians think the situation has gone too far because they lost their largest customer and they were forced to invest scores of billions to rewire their energy networks to feed China, which was not their preferred outcome in our view. The natural gas that Russia was supplying to Germany and the rest of Western Europe, that it's no longer supplying, where's that gas going or gone? Some of it is not being produced. Some of it is going to the LNG export market. Um, and much of it will eventually um, go to China. There's just no question about it. But in the long run, Putin's energy will find its way to the market. And by the way, we've long argued we should be encouraging every molecule of fossil fuels he is producing to get to the market in an effort to drive down price, which is the only way to impact his revenue. In fact, we have, to make a point, been saying that the U.S. Navy should be escorting Russian oil tankers uh, to make sure that their oil gets to the market because this will drive down price. The increased friction costs of the war in Ukraine have only emboldened Putin and have only enriched him. And so this, um, the, this, is, this policy is completely backwards. Our sanctions policy is, was designed to fail from the beginning. We predicted it would fail from the beginning, and this is one prediction that we have gotten um, quite, quite correct. Okay, just moving on. You've written about gold and the implications for the dollar as a reserve asset, particularly in the context of the G7 looking to carry out the seizure of Russian assets, which are Western liabilities. You seem to favor gold as what Zoltan Pozvar calls outside money. Are you bearish on the prospects of the dollar? I would say that we are making decisions that put the prospects of the dollar in some jeopardy. Of course, there's a long line of people who have predicted the fall of the US dollar, and, and those predictions have not materialized yet. Um, the piece we wrote basically could be summarized in one sentence, which is, for gold, it's 2024 or bust. Like This is the year where the, the sort of conspiratorial thinking that the gold price is being suppressed in London and New York will no longer work because of the development of the Shanghai gold market and premiums of, of the gold price in Shanghai will drive the emptying of Western vaults and the, the shipping of gold to, to Asia. Um, and so if the banks were manipulating the price of gold down, <clears throat> and many, many, many people believe they were, um, that, that mechanism is coming to an, an end here soon. And additionally, if we do, and all signs indicate that we will go through with the seizure of those Russian reserves, um, hard to see how that is an inspiring development for those wondering where their marginal dollar of central bank reserves should be deployed. And we would have to imagine that this could only be bullish for gold. War, instability, um, loss of faith in fiat currencies, these are all things historically that have been 
that have made the attributes of gold more desirable. I, I hesitate to talk about the price of gold. Yeah. You know, we, and I should say, we don't view gold as an investment. We don't speculate in gold. We earn money in fiat because we live in the fiat world. We save money by buying real assets like gold and land and collectibles. Yeah. And then we, inv we invest privately where we can impact the outcome. And so gold plays an important role as a vehicle of savings. You know, if 20 gold eagles will buy you a mid-sized SUV today. We believe in 20 years, 20 gold eagles will buy you the equivalent of a mid-sized SUV then. And, and Which is an insurance reason. policy for what might Correct. happen to the fiat system. We so, view it as raising the floor of our net worth. Uh, yes. Okay. And in that context, I can't leave this subject without asking you about Bitcoin and the shenanigans around the Bitcoin ETF, which, yes. pardon the analogy, sounds a bit like uh, letting the fox into the hen house on the part of the SEC. Wow. I, I can only direct your listeners to a wonderfully prescient and beautifully written piece by um, Epsilon Theory, published in 2021, Ben Hunt. The, the piece was titled, In Praise of Bitcoin, with an exclamation point yes. at the end of Bitcoin. Because what we're seeing today is the Wall Streetification, the exact opposite of yes. the ethos of, of Bitcoin. Um, which was always going to be, according to Ben Hunt, the inevitable outcome. You know, if I'm a no coiner. I have nothing against Bitcoin. We have many proponents of Bitcoin who subscribe to Doomberg because the overlap in the Venn diagram of people who are long gold and people who are long Bitcoin, it, it's not a circle, but there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. And they have a similar distrust of government that those of us who enjoy gold and land and collectibles um, are, are sort of programmed to have. And so, and we've we've enjoyed writing about Bitcoin, and we you know people like to make fun of us because um, when pushed on a podcast, I once said I wouldn't be a buyer of Bitcoin unless it hit five thousand, and um, and it didn't hit five thousand, and so uh, I, I have not yet outright purchased Bitcoin, and so it, it's just one of those things. It's fun to write about the the, the Bitcoin cult it can be a bit of an interesting thing to tangle with. We've mostly tried to have fun with them and be polite with them, and they, and they have mostly reciprocated. Yeah. What do you, what's your take of what is happening in China? It's the recovery that didn't happen in 2023, still doesn't seem to be happening so far in 2024. China is very difficult for a Western analyst to penetrate and any Western analyst who claims to have special knowledge of what the inner workings of the CCP involve, um, we would look at with a, a dubious eye. Um, I think the number one issue that we need to concern ourselves with uh, with respect to China is the situation in Taiwan. And I think the recent election results there um, probably add tension to the situation. But as it pertains to macroeconomics in China, we just don't have the expertise. And one of the things I pride myself on is when I don't have expertise, I try my best to not speculate. One of my pet theories is that 2024 is going to be the year of the chainsaw, that the Javier Malay's uh, election in Argentina last year is the straw in the wind of the, and his appearance at Davos last week was it was like some it, <laughs> it, it felt like it was sort of a we'd wandered onto the set of a remake of Atlas Shrugged yeah um, it was just and it reminded me in uh, of Ricky Gervais's um, 2020 uh, Golden Globes um, award ceremony uh, the, unfortunately, at Davos, we didn't see the um, the faces of the elites, the gathered elites, to see what they uh, how they were reacting. Unlike uh, Ricky Gervais's brilliant uh, takedown of the of the Hollywood elite in 2020. So, you know, I guess to make a question out of it, we've had the we had the COP28 where it looked like you know the adults have sort of finally taking over. Do you think the same is happening politically? You know, was this Davos a you know, it, it, are the adults taking over at the World Economic Forum or is this just yeah. uh, wishful thinking here? Well, I think the World Economic Forum is nothing but a subscription grift, but um, that's that's <laughs> probably for yeah. another day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we assign to them far too much power and uh, this only adds to Klaus Schwab's uh, bank account. But I digress to your question. Um, we are watching the developments in Argentina very closely, not the least of which because they have what many consider to be a top 10 shale resource in the country that is mostly un undeveloped and whether um, the synergies of the development of technology driven by U.S. companies can be effectively deployed around the world is one of the biggest questions for the next decade. And I think the consolidation we're seeing in the U.S. shale patch 
lends, uh, lends tailwinds to that effort because Pioneer, for example, might be very good in the Permian, but it doesn't know how to operate internationally in the same way that Exxon does. And tucking Pioneer's technology under the Exxon family of companies uh, might be bullish for the future production of, of shale type resources around the world. But we shall see. This is certainly the beginnings of a potential political revolution. Revolutions sometimes get ugly and don't always end the way you want them to. Sure. And Absolutely. so it, it's going to be interesting. I don't expect the traditional sources of power in Argentina or the US or Europe to go away quietly. I think it would be naive to assume that they will. And so um, we are entering a period of dangerous disruption. I believe Neil Howe would call it the, the last stage of the fourth turning. Uh, on the back end of fourth turnings comes the rebirth. And boy, the US has a lot going for it um, when you just take a step back and assess uh, where we are. But um, the friction of the transition uh, might be challenged. Yes. And of course, the, there's a UK angle to the, uh, the Argentina story in the shape of... Indeed, there is. That they have huge resources, which with the correct technology and investment can be converted into reserves, which can then eventually be converted into production. Interesting data point. Maybe I'll just leave you with this because it's, it's kind of a funny one. We did a 100-year analysis of the, the U.S. estimated proved reserves for oil, just crude oil. And if you plot it on a chart, 100 data points with an R squared of 0.9, Predicted future proved reserves of the U.S. is always 11 times last year's production. Right. Yes. So you, you yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just is. 100 years ago, it was. It's 11 plus or minus one year. That's like two sigma of the, of, of the deviation of that, of that histogram. The more you produce, the more, the more we find. And the less you produce, the less you think you have. Yeah. And I think... I don't know if it's related, but I think I read that Dan Jurgen once saying that something like 85 to 90 percent of the known oil we have today in a geological or geotechnical sense are enhancements of prior year's reserves, if that makes sense, rather than yes. new discoveries. So we think of a, the increase in the amount of recoverable reserves being because we find another Alaska or another North Sea, but that's the exception. But uh, the, the rule is that we just get more out of what we already know is there. 100%. And in fact, the, the definition of reserve is not a geological one. It's an accounting one yes. which explains the mystery of as to why this number is always 11 times last year's production. Yes. It's, it's essentially a discounting factor, very conservative. But I can assure you that the U.S. has far more than 11 years of oil and gas reserves to, uh, ready to exploit. One of the big stories of the last couple of years is generative AI, artificial intelligence. One thing that we are reasonably confident in predicting is that the explosion and need to power these computers is going to normalize nuclear energy. Because when you talk about the quality of electricity, its stability, capacity factors, SMR technology in particular, small modular reactor nuclear is a perfect fit. And as a general rule, as a postulate, Humanity always does what it needs to do to stay on that computing line. And so we think that um, AI will, one of the big impacts of AI will be a normalization of nuclear power, which I don't think it's a coincidence that nuclear was labeled green in COP28 for the first time, just as we'll be needing it to help support this ever increasing power demand uh, of our uh, servers around the world. Who are the influence and thought leaders that you follow? I've seen you quote people like Luke Roman, Brett Johnson. You've made references to the great blog, Bad Catitude, which I'm a big fan of. But what are your must-consume media sources? Yeah, I consume Luke Roman. You know, uh, Grant Williams is, is a dear friend of ours and a, and a brilliant writer. We listen to uh, all manner of podcasts. The Decouple podcast by Dr. Chris Kiefer in Canada is one that we always try to listen to. We Daniel Jurgen, who you mentioned, we read all of his books. Yeah. Um, Back Backlof Smear, of course, who is yes. sort of the, yeah, yeah. The, God, the godfather of, of correct energy thinking uh, in our regard. Uh, we like Alex Epstein's work. He's quite the um, articulate defender of fossil fuels. Uh, but also yeah. we, we read a lot of, uh, uh, of people on the left as well. I, I, I think I don't want to just have my biases confirmed. I like to have them occasionally challenged and all manner of leftward leaning blogs that we read. And also we read the, the mainstream media every morning. I read the Financial Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, and LA Times. Uh, if for no other reason, they tend to be excellent fodder for future articles. And since we produce six to eight publications a month. Um, I'm always on the lookout for fun, interesting things to write about. And 
and there's never a shortage of such things. And so I'm, I'm grateful to the mainstream media for, for being, you know, <laughs> uh, such a, a rich source of things to ridicule or to explain or to make fun of. And of course, um, Gehring and Rosenzweig and Pick Your Favorite and Adam Taggart's podcast, that the list goes on. Generally speaking, the popular Substacks that we read are the ones that are popular because, as I mentioned earlier, Substack is, is a really a meritocracy still. It doesn't have the heavy hand of censorship yet. Remains to be seen uh, whether it will eventually evolve. But for now, um, you can read really amazing work by people who you don't always agree with, people who sometimes use language you find offensive, people who sometimes hold views that, that you don't hold. But at the same time, they might be right on another topic and worth reading about in that narrow way. And, and I prefer to decide my, for myself what I would like to consume and read and not have the government necessarily dictate it to me. Doonberg, I really appreciate the time you spent today. Of the time we've spent chatting has just flown by. I've got many more questions I would love to pile on, but we must move on. Uh, sure, you've got other things to do, but thank you so much. And um, I continue to follow your work with great interest. I open every email I get from you as quickly as I can. And I'm, it's, a, it's a great product. And I think it's, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation as well and, and would be happy to come back anytime you'll have me. Thanks a lot.